Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today for a special presentation from our science division, all about some of the things that we have seen around our houses and in our neighborhoods as we go for walks to head out and get some fresh air. My name is Talia. I'm the distance learning coordinator at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, and I am joined today by several different folks from our science division, spanning divisions from earth sciences and paleontology to image archives to zoology. But one thing that these museum nerds have in common, even if their subjects are very different, is that all of them are excited by, fascinated by, and totally in love with the natural world. All of these fine folks have been spending a lot of time outdoors lately, and in addition to a little bit of a suntan, have managed to capture some photos of animal evidence left behind in their neighborhoods and around their homes. So even if they didn't get to see wildlife themselves, they did get to see rats and scat. So today, they're gonna to be sharing some photos with all of us and answering your questions about animals, wildlife, whatever you'd like to ask them. I'm gonna be watching our stream today on my handy dandy device. So go ahead and leave us a comment with any questions that you might have. And now if you're watching, go ahead and let us know where you're watching from today. Maybe you've seen something exciting around in your neighborhood. Maybe you have bird feeders out in your yard. Maybe you've seen tracks and scat of your own. Or maybe you're like Kristen McKenzie, who's gonna be our first speaker today. And you have a little canine helper with you today. So we might get to hear from healer slash velociraptor, Freya. Without any further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and kick it over to our collections manager for earth sciences and paleontology, Kristen. Kristen, tell us a little bit about what you have seen on some of your travels around the neighborhood recently. Hi, well, we've been all comparing uh, photos of the things that we've been finding, and I was shocked to let's see if I can share a screen. So I was really shocked to see beaver evidence in the middle of town. So this is over by Westerly um, Creek, over by the Denver Film Museum or Film School. Sorry, um, and I don't if think we're quite seeing your image yet, Chris. We may okay. Get it up. <laughs> I can share mine as well. Okay. Continue telling us about those beavers. Let's see. Are you sharing it? I can go ahead and do it. How okay. about that? <laughs> Everyone give me just a moment to get my screen up and on the screen. We should be good to go. All right, Kristen, tell us what you got. Okay, so that first slide, you see the little red arrows. Um, the first one in sort of the middle of the photo, that's the front foot of a beaver. And in the back on the right hand side is back foot of the beaver. And this is like right in town um, over by the Denver Film Museum. And uh, I was kind of shocked. So there's an actual uh, beaver dam just up from these uh, tracks here that's actually active. Um, and so when I'm out thinking about, you know, tracks in the field, I'm sort of in the back of my mind for the second slide thinking about what what it was like back in the fossil record. So this is sort of a comparison of the largest beaver ever known, uh, Castoroides, and this was in North America. This is huge. This thing is, um, it's over six feet tall. So pretty amazing if you can think of six foot uh, beavers running around Aurora um, in Denver area. So we actually have a jaw, cast of a jaw in our collections. So yeah. When I see tracks, I start thinking about the fossil record. Well, of course you would as a paleontologist, <laughs> right? All paleontologists also have to be good naturalists and good biologists. So that makes a lot of sense. And I have to say, I find it a little bit mind blowing that beavers were that big. Uh, yeah. I have always thought of them as very small and cute and cuddly, which they are now, thank goodness. So <laughs> thank you for that nightmare fuel um, and for blowing my mind a little bit. Next up, we're going to hear from Jeff Stevenson, who is our collections manager for zoology. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. But Jeff, you got photos somewhere pretty exotic and exciting, right? Before the world locked down, you got to go on a pretty cool trip. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah pardon me. Yeah, the, the tracks that you see are from a white wagtail, white, white wagtail, which is a bird who left its mark in the desert sands of Egypt near a boundary stella of Akhenaten, the heretic pharaoh in Egypt, when I was there this past January. One of the reasons for my trip was to see ancient sites and artifacts. And, but also, I was there to study the wax cones worn by ancient Egyptians, as seen in this photo. This was taken in from the tomb of Maya, who was the 18th dynasty 
treasurer for Akhenaten and his son, the Pharaoh Tutankhamun. But that probably best left for uh, future science on the spot, maybe on ancient deodorants or something like that. The wagtails can be seen up and down the Nile in other parts of the Middle East. And indeed, they do wag their tails, especially as they run along in search for food. But you don't have to travel to Egypt to see animal sign like cracks and scat. We can see them all over the state. Now you said we were gonna see some scat today and I've got an image up on the screen now of scat from a large local beloved animal. Who is that? Yeah, this scat is from a bison in, and it's from Elbert County. So scat can tell us a number of stories, including what animals are found in the area, but they have information also about the animal's health, their ecology and uh, behavior. And they are an important part of our ecosystem. Now, the Denver Museum actively studies the beetles who prefer to eat the bison dung. And if you look closely at this pile, you'll see a little mound of dirt next to it. This is where a rainbow scarab, which is a very, very pretty dung beetle, was excavating its burrow to feed its kids. And they're not called dung beetles for nothing. So sometimes when you're looking at animal sign, you get two furs, but this is really a kind of a three fur. So you have the big mound of bison dung, and you have that little mound of rainbow scarab excavation. And then on top of the big mound, there's this little black. That's, um, well, let's just say sometimes kids like to imitate their parents. That's from a baby bison who just managed to go where mom went. So uh, when, when I'm out looking for signs, I'm old school, so I carry things like field guides. This is the Roger Tory Peterson Guide to Animal Tracks for Mostly Mammals. And then there's another book, Bird Tracks and Sign. Both of these are really excellent, but you don't have to be old school like me. You can actually get online, take it with your mobile phone, and get all sorts of resources for identifying Take photos of these things, and like any good naturalist, I recommend getting your field note. Write it down where and when you find it. Have something to associate with that photograph, and enjoy. Very good. So all of you parents out there, maybe you're struggling with some potty training woes for your small ones. Just know that bison have the same issue. So if bison can get through it, so can you. And we believe all right, next up, we're going to hear from Renee O'Connell, who is our image archivist, and she's got a few images of her very own to share today that she captured on her property in Evergreen. So Renee, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again. We're going to see that bison dung again for just a moment, and then we'll switch over to your images. Again, I told you there was going to be some chat today. We've got more to come. All right, Renee, tell us a little bit about your photos. Okay, well, the um, what's very common here, especially on this property, would be elk and deer. And the first picture that we have here is elk. We see that a lot. I may not see the elk, but I see what they leave me. And that has kind of prompted us to start looking at what else is on the property that we don't see, which would be mainly nocturnal. I'll see a lot of fox, which is not unusual, but I actually see the fox. But this next slide really had me going because it looks to be coyote poop. And the coyote, I would normally expect to see more hair. I'm not seeing a lot of hair, which is a little bit unusual. But what really got me, if we back out of this site just a little bit with the next slide, you'll see that it is more than one visit. Now, typically you will have things like a latrine, a natural latrine. Possum do these a lot. Some fox do it where they go back to the same spot. Coyote might use sometimes their scent or poop as what they call a postmark, where they're kind of territory, but you don't often always see them repeating going back to this a lot. 
like we saw under this rock. Now, I will mention that about uh, 100 feet away was a deer carcass. So they, somebody cleaned it really, really, really well. I'm guessing coyote. Um, but that's, so that's what we see in Evergreen. A lot of deer, a lot of elk, and a lot of coyote. Very good. You know, I never knew that coyotes might be interested in using the same spot as their bathroom over and over and over again. I can tell you from experience, my border collie mix has that tendency. He has one spot in the shared yard of our apartment building where he likes to go and good luck getting him to go anywhere else. That is his spot. So perhaps that's a trait shared by a lot of different canines. Fascinating. I was going to say, same, they come from the same place. <laughs> they, do. they do. All right, next up, we're going to talk to Nicole Nye-Yagel, who is our assistant collections manager for paleontology and earth sciences. And she has been doing a lot of hiking around her home in Boulder. Nicole, tell us what you got. And I believe you're going to share your screen. Yeah. Yeah, I love looking for animal signs. Um, even if you don't get to see the animal, um, it feels a lot like it to me. Um, and I love it when you can see the uh, character of the animal's tracks. Um, so I'll show you a few different things that I've found and how uh, what you should look for is kind of like how these things are different. So this is um, one that's pretty common. This, uh, at least in the mountainous areas, is snowshoe hare and a rabbit um, will look essentially the same, just smaller feet. Um, and they have this very particular pattern with the two big feet or hind feet registering in front of their little front feet that are not in line. They're kind of um, uh, offset. This little spot down here, that's rabbit pee. So that's my scat part. And rabbit pee sometimes looks like blood, but it's just really orange from all the pine needles that they eat. Um, this, these guys are weasel fellas, and uh, they have a really weird walking pattern. They're so long and they kind of lope along. And so they have this really distinctive kind of um, diagonal pattern of trackways here. There's a little squirrel up here, kind of like a miniature rabbit, except their front feet are parallel. Um, and the best part about this track, some kind of weasel, this is a pine marten on the left, weasel over here of some kind. You can see where its tail hit the ground. <laughs> between its steps. Um, and then these are comparison between cats and dogs. So on the left, this is a bobcat. And on the right, this is either a really small coyote or a fox. <laughs> Can't quite tell, but some kind of canid. Um, and I know it's a canid because you can see its little uh, claw marks. You'll never see, well, essentially never see claw marks on a cat's footprints because they retract their claws. You can even see the little carpal pad on this one. And another thing about cats is they'll step in their own tracks, direct registering. Foxes will often do that too, but this one's not. So you can see he's not stepping in his own tracks there. My favorite cat track that I found recently is the cougar. <laughs> so there's a lot of people in Boulder saying the cougars are coming into town. I haven't seen them, but um, uh, near uh, Ralph Price Reservoir kind of area, I see tons of cougar tracks and you'll never see their little claw marks uh, or big claw marks. <laughs> this, this one was big, <laughs> as big as my hand. <laughs> um, but they will also do a direct register and stepping in their tracks. Uh, and also you can look at how big that main pad is. That is much bigger than a dog. So sometimes like a big golden retriever's prints can look a lot like a cougar, but you'll see their claws and they'll have a much narrower track usually. Um, so my favorite fossil tracks, because uh, I'm in earth sciences, are uh, pterodactyls. And I just think they're such weird animals, these flying reptiles. And uh, when their tracks were discovered, it kind of proved that at least some pterosaurs walked on their wings as well, instead of like tucking their wings up like a bird. So this trackway, you can see its wing three claws hitting behind its um, hind foot there. And the way that's kind of positioning kind of suggests that they had a pretty upright stance and were maybe more graceful on the ground than what was originally thought. I've got a little, little image there showing you I'm walking along. <laughs> so those are my tracks. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, I have to say, I think, you not only shared with us some important distinctions between different species, but also some really important information for budding naturalists who are hoping to get out there. I know I have been on trails near Boulder before, and I've seen what I thought were big cat tracks before and thought, yikes, I better watch out. 
but knowing how to tell the difference between, yep, maybe just a big golden retriever out for a fun yeah. walk with his family and a puma or a cougar, whatever you want to call it, that could be really important in saving your life. So keep that in mind. Look for those claw yeah. marks, then you've got a I dog. should say, um, where I go hiking in those areas where I find the tracks, I never go alone. <laughs> also good advice as well. Yeah. <laughs> all. Fabulous. All right, next up, let's hear from Holger Peterman, who is a postdoctoral fellow in paleontology and earth sciences, who has some fossil tracks to share with us. Yes, I do. Um, what I... I think we might have just had Holger freeze, so we'll see if he comes back. Technology, right? Kristen and Nicole, perhaps while we wait for Holger to join us again, could one of you talk to, maybe you know a little bit about the specimens he's gonna share or, oh, looks like you're back. Am Holger, I back? we lost you for a second, but here you are. Yeah, that happens every once in a while. Um, yes, so what I brought with me today is something that I used to see every day going to my undergraduate department um, in Germany. And this is a plate, a track weight slab um, that is almost 300 million years old. And what is really fascinating about this is, for us paleontologists, trackways always represent the direct interaction of an animal with its environment, so it tracks behavior. And in this case, the behavior is really special because it is nesting behavior. So we see two individual trackways, right, essentially going south, north, and east, west. Um, and then we have these little, we call them Easter eggs, back home, um, these little balls here. And when you look at them closer, they have little claw marks and scratch marks. So we think that an animal was actually trying to figure out if the substrate, the sediment, was just the right moisture for laying its eggs in. And another animal showed that it was the right moisture and put this big thing there. And that's what I think is a nest. And I'm fairly confident that it is a nest because in front of it, I have more of these scratch and claw marks that represent the, um, or that show the outline of the body of that animal pretty well. And in a they're almost unique um, situation, we actually know what animal made these tracks, which is incredibly difficult to do in fossils. Um, and it's this, there it is, it's this little ancestor to reptiles uh, called Orobates. Um, and you can see those big paddle-like fingers that are perfect for scratching. Fascinating stuff. Um, I think one of my favorite things about your presentation is that it gives us an insight into how paleontologists work, right? I think a lot of us who maybe know a little bit about paleontology but don't know as much as a postdoctoral fellow or collections manager would, um, we sometimes wonder, wait, how is it that we managed to figure out all of these things about creatures that lived so long before humans even evolved. And I think you've showed us uh, a piece of evidence that paleontologists that. Yeah. And as a naturalist, it's also important to note that yes, things like tracks do let us know how animals interact with their environment. So not just about finding those cool footprints, there's a lot more that you can learn about animals' behavior and ecology too. So man, Holger, you just you nailed that, hit that right on the head. All right, and last but not least, we have Andy Dahl who is the Assistant Collections Manager for Zoology to share a photo that he took in the Denver metro area. Andy, what you got? Thanks, Talia. Um, yeah, the photo here, let me see if I can get it on the screen. See that? There it is. You might need to go full screen for us. Otherwise, I know we've got just the one image. Just trying. There we go. Um, so the image here, this is a kill deer. Uh, this image was taken out at the uh, Rocky Mountain Park. Very common grassland birds that you can see all over the place. They're very um, gregarious. You hear them calling and um, calling out their territories, trying to trace away predators. Um, so they're pretty easy to detect in the environment. Um, but why I am showing you these guys is that um, I wanted to show off another way you can document tracks that you find out in the field. Um, is by making casts of them. So this is a cast of a field air print that I uh, I made, well, 2002 when I first moved to Colorado. I was trying to uh, document, you know, the Colorado wildlife. So um, I was making 
track cast. And so this is a um, killed deer that I I discovered, I documented um, out in Eagle County, so up in the mountains. Um, it's a fun little activity. It's a great way of um, bringing things back from the field. Um, pictures are great, but to have like physical thing that you can take uh, accurate measurements from, uh, there's a lot uh, you can you can get from this kind of cast. Uh, so uh, this you can see that the killdeer are tridactyl, got three toes, good way of identifying birds or narrowing down what kind of bird track you're looking at. Um, and it's really fun to do. All you have to do is bring a little plaster of Paris with you. They so throw a Ziploc bag into my backpack, a little extra water. And I typically bring wax hard a frame around the track. So like that. Um, great activity for the kids. They love um, getting messy. So um, these is, this is really most appropriate for working with mud track. Doesn't work so well in the snow and sand is a little tricky to work with too. But um, if you want to get a little dirty, you can get some mud on your hands, plaster of Paris all over the place, uh, bring some tracks back to the house. Good thing that killed you are often found near water. Yeah. Good thing about those. All well, awesome. I think that is that is all that we have in terms of pictures. And I haven't seen any questions pop in yet. I do see a lot of folks watching, so maybe they're still taking in the information. So folks, if you do have a question, folks watching on Facebook, feel free to leave a comment with anything that you might be wondering about or anything that you like to share. Is there anything that you have seen near your house lately uh, or maybe on a walk or maybe on a nice socially distant, but very responsible hike that you've taken? Um, feel free to pop that in the comments because we would love to hear. And while those comments come in, if anyone has anything they'd like to share, I would love to ask our panelists one last question. We'll have each of you answer a quick answer and we'll go in the same order that we did for our presentation. What is some advice that you have for folks that are looking to get outside and spot wildlife or spot track or scat or other signs that they've been there? So Kristen, what would you recommend? Oh, well, my favorite place are always uh, the edges of streams. And you're always gonna come across crossings, animal crossing ways. They're kind of where all the animals converge on to cross that body of water. That is my favorite place. Walk upstream and find those places. Very good, awesome, Jeff. What do you think? Oh, looking for sign in all seasons. As Nicole showed, you can see wonderful tracks in the snow. I remember seeing it. I, I didn't take a photo of this, but um, it was a rabbit. It was bounding. And then all you saw was wing, the wings of a raptor impression. And then no more rabbit track. But Every, every season has something. Birds are building nests in the spring. Nests are still there well into the winter. Um, insects are going to be motoring around starting about now and going all the way through September. And they are going to leave their own kind of sign. Um, so every season is a good season to look for animal signs. Indeed. Yeah, get out there, find a favorite spot and visit it several different times a year and see what you can see. Renee, what advice do you have for budding naturalists out there? I think this is a really interesting time we're in in that you're going to see things you normally don't see because you're in a place you're not normally, right? We're not normally home all day. And one thing I've noticed here is I'm now a identifying birds, which is kind of hard. <laughs> I didn't think it would be as hard as it is. And I have seen just in the two months I've been here a real change. So I'm seeing migratory birds, birds that are passing through, and some that stay. But um, I'll add on to something that Jeff said as well. And Kristen, you know, if you're in the woods anywhere, all you have to do is look down. Most people don't look down. You're looking up, you're looking around, which is good. But if you just look down, within minutes, you're gonna find something. You're gonna find a track or you're gonna find scat. And there are lots of online resources for identifying scat. And scat is the best way to find what you don't see, to find who's been there, because a lot of them are nocturnal. There's a lot of nocturnal animals. I get, my dogs go crazy at a certain time every night. And I've got a goal that when the weather's nice, I'm gonna hang out with a nice flashlight in the next time, because I know when it is, which tells me there's something that's passing through that's nocturnal. 
and I'm going to be safe up on my second floor uh, balcony with a flashlight at that particular time, just looking around. But I think, you know what, you can find it everywhere. Indeed you can. Yeah. So just like Jeff said, look in different seasons. You're talking about look at different times of day. You always got to have your naturalist brain on. And once you get it on, you start to see and hear some really amazing things. Nicole, what about you? What, what would you like to share with anyone out there who'd like to go find tracks or scat of their own? Well, I would second Renee in that, you know, slow down, take some time to stop on your hikes and look around. Um, maybe not just the view, but what's nearby. Um, you probably noticed that I like looking in the snow for tracks. Uh, best advice for that is to get up early and I'm not an early riser. That's my main struggle, but I try really hard, especially now to avoid people. <laughs> get up and get out there as early as possible um, and use something as a scale like take photos of what you find even if it's just like my tiny hand if you have a scale bar even better but <laughs> take photos and do some research later if you don't know what it is <laughs> could be something way cooler than you realize true Holger, any advice for you yeah i mean as you can see from my virtual background um, i like to go places dry and hot um, those tend to preserve scat and trackway, trackways for a little longer than places that are humid and cold, or especially humid. So I just suggest trying to make your way down to the, to the sand dunes and looking for a track there. It's a good call as well. Yeah, hot and dry areas can be really interesting because they can sometimes preserve things like bones and stuff too. You might find sun bleached bones laying out on the earth. So that's an interesting way of seeing what species are there too. I am no good at bone ID, but I take pictures of them all the time. Um, and then I come show these people later and I say, what is this? And then they help. Great. Andy, any advice from you? And then I do see a few questions that have come in. So we'll answer those and then I think we'll be about at our time. Uh, yeah, I like, to, um, I like to find game trails, kind of see where they go and kind of follow them. Uh, more often than not, the most obvious ones are made by the large ungulates we have around here, like elk and deer, uh, but lots of different kinds of critters are going to use those and they leave signs along the way. So um, I think it's kind of fun to follow those trails. Pretend you're the animal, think about what, where they're going and why they're going that way and uh, it kind of opens it, your mind up into their world. Solid advice from a really brilliant panel of scientists. So those of you watching out there, if you're starting to put together your weekend plans, I think you've got them set. You've got some really good advice to get out there and see some tracks and chat. So bring a mask, bring a cluster of Paris water, get out there and see what you can see. All right, I have a few questions that I would like to direct to our panel and we'll see if we can get them answered. First up, I do see a couple of comments from folks saying what they have seen around their houses, homes, or on walks recently. Sonora says that, oh, I just saw a small coyote on my walk in Evergreen eating a little something. So breakfast on the go, perhaps. And it looks like Niles says, I saw a marmot at about 8,500 feet outside Evergreen. And I thought they lived higher. That's kind of surprising. I live in Jefferson County and we had a case, I think last year, where a marmot hitched a ride in someone's car and ended up in their chicken coop. So you never know what you might see. Sometimes uh, be a little atypical. Uh, as far as questions go, let's see. Maura is wondering, have any of you had surprising encounters with wildlife that you'd like to share? And I think we have time for one answer. Jeff, how about you? Well, one time I was with our entomologist, Frank Krell on Green Mountain, and we were, a, he's a beetle guy, so we were hunting for beetles. Um, and we were going through a stand of choke cherries, and um, we weren't having a whole lot of luck and getting deeper and deeper into the trees. And then I realized that uh, we were in the middle of an unused or old uh, layer of a carnivore. And um, I didn't want to stick around to find out whose it was, but it was like, okay, Frank, if this is like a mountain lion, we have butterfly nets. What are we going to do? And my, the answer in my head was, we're going to be lunch. Um, so it was a little, when you, when you, like Nicole, when she's showing those tracks, it's like, yeah, there's the fourth largest cat on earth. And it was right here just before I was. 
I do think it was a mountain lion because the way the bones of the deer that were in the den were broken. Um, so that was interesting. Interesting is a good word to sum that up. So just page advice for all of you out there who are headed out this weekend, maybe bring a little bit more than a butterfly net and certainly bring a buddy. Good stuff. Um, I see that Kristen has answered in the comments Danani's question about resources for identifying birds by their calls, which as a budding birder is something I always care about. So thank you, Kristen, for answering that. Um, as one last question from Aaron, I wonder maybe Andy, you can, can share an answer to this one. Have there been any like breakthroughs in the science of GAT in the world of in the last few years, is there anything that we've managed to learn from poop, or is there maybe still more to learn? Uh, I mean, there's always more to learn, especially when you're talking about poop. Uh, but as far as groundbreaking discoveries, um, not that I'm aware of. It's a great way to to learn about animal diets and um, and also get a sense of their their movement patterns. You know, they travel and they eat different things from different areas. They can leave that sketch and so you uh, make connections across home ranges based on the kind of food you're finding in sketch. I don't know, Jeff, have you heard of anything groundbreaking about poop recently? There are some ongoing studies right now in terms of uh, the components of poop that make it good for the environment and the role of beetles in getting that into the soil. Um, I know that we get DNA actually from the poo the, of the animal that deposited it, uh, but also of what they're eating. So it's not just a pile that you're looking at. That's for starters. Then you get into the analysis of what's in that poo and who made it. and you can get high tech. Indeed. So all of you who have ever been told by a parent, poop's not an appropriate subject to talk about, we'd like to add a caveat to that and say, you have to be around the right people and in the right place to talk about poop. But if you grow up to work in a museum, it's pretty much always the right time and place. So that is about all the time we have. Thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in for this fascinating, a little bit freaky, a little bit gross, but 100% fun conversation. And we hope you got the scoop on poop. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Thanks for your questions. We'll see you next time. Stay safe, stay curious, and keep tuning in for more exciting programs from the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.